The Sherlock of Diseases Analytical Epidemiology Hi, welcome to another session on epidemiology. Let's have a quick glance at the three main categories of epidemiology. In our previous video, I discussed how I use descriptive epidemiological studies to formulate the hypothesis. My next step is to test the hypothesis to find relevant associations. And this is done using analytical epidemiology. Here, I am concerned with the search for causes and effects of the disease, as this helps me assess whether there is a statistical association between the disease and the risk factor. In this type of epidemiology, I ask the question, why and how? The three main designs of this study are case control, cohort and ecological designs. Let's first talk about case control studies. This type of study is also known as a case referent study, a trohawk study or a retrospective study. It is a type of observational study in which I take two existing groups, namely cases and controls, and compare them. Note that the disease here has already occurred. I collect the data and go back in time to investigate the patterns of exposure. Let me explain this better with an example. If I use the group of immunized children as cases, then the non-immunized children can be considered controls and look for factors of interest in their histories. Let's discuss further. In this design, I use a four-step approach. Selection of cases and controls, matching, measurement of exposure, analysis and interpretation. In the first step of selecting my cases and controls, I define a case using two specifications. The first one is the diagnostic criteria, where before I start my study, I include the diagnostic criteria of the disease and the state of the disease. For example, breast cancer stage 1. The next criteria are the eligibility criteria, where I take in only the new cases or incidents without considering the prevalence. My cases are drawn from hospitals or the general population and should represent the community. The controls I select must be free from the disease under study. My second step is to match my cases and controls. Matching refers to choosing the cases and controls simultaneously. If not sufficiently matched, there could be errors in my results. For example, matching cases and controls of the same age, sex and occupation ensures no confounding factors between the exposure and outcome of my study. Matching is of two types. One is pairwise matching and the other is called group matching. If you wonder what a confounding factor means, here's the definition. A confounding factor may mask an actual association or falsely demonstrate an apparent association between the study variables where no real association between them exists. For example, Age can be a confounding factor for individuals who undergo a fat loss program. Younger individuals tend to lose weight more quickly than older individuals. This can lead to errors in the study. Now let's move on to my third step, which is measuring the exposure. I do this by going back in time, using interviews and questionnaires, or by studying previous records of cases, such as hospital records, employment records, etc. The last step is to analyze and interpret. In this step, I find out the exposure rates among the cases and controls and estimate the disease risk associated with exposure. This is done using the odds ratio. An odds ratio, OR, also known as a cross product ratio, is a measure of the association between an exposure and an outcome. The OR represents the odds of an outcome occurring when given a particular exposure, compared to the odds of the outcome occurring in the absence of that exposure. In simpler terms, let's say it was not supposed to be raining that day, and yet, the minute you decided to step out, it began to pour. The expression, what are the odds, 
or what are the chances of this happening is commonly used in these situations. Now, how do case control studies benefit me? First, they help me carry out these studies easily and with a limited budget. Second, the number of subjects required is comparatively fewer than in cohort studies. What are the challenges I face using this design? Firstly, validating the information obtained can be challenging because some of my data was collected over a telephone interview. Secondly, the selection of an appropriate control group may take time and effort. And thirdly, I cannot measure the incidents. Lane and Claypon's 1926 study on risk factors for breast cancer is regarded as one of the landmark case control studies. Moving on now to the next design, the cohort studies. Cohort is trohawk, spelled backward. Therefore, it is the opposite of case control studies. In this type of study, I select a comparison group or a control group, but the disease does not occur. Here, I compare the experience of one group exposed to the risk factor, also called the exposed group, with that of the group not exposed to the risk factor or the control group. I then follow them up for years to check for the association between the exposure and outcome. Let us understand what a cohort is. It is defined as a group of people sharing a similar characteristic. For example, a cohort of people born in Mumbai in the year 1980 will be called a birth cohort. Based on the direction of the study, I can now subdivide the cohort study into prospective, retrospective and ambidirectional cohorts. Let us get into the details of each of them. The word prospective refers to something effective in the future. Therefore, in this type of study, I follow a group of individuals over time and collect the data before the disease has occurred. For example, I follow and observe groups of people who smoke and do not smoke for some time to gather information and record the development of outcomes such as lung cancer. The word retrospective means to look back to past events. Therefore, this type of study is also called a historical cohort study. I look back in time and use the pre-existing data from old medical records to examine the relationship between exposure and outcome. For example, I identify a group of people who smoked and a group who never smoked and then look back at medical records to see how the rate of lung cancer differs between the two groups. Finally, the word ambidirectional means to be in both directions. In this study, the direction may not be as well defined as a prospective or retrospective one. For example, if I want to assess the incidence of lung cancer among radiation workers in a hospital, I select a cohort of people and look back in time to see whether they have been exposed to radiation or not. I then follow them up for some time to check whether they develop skin cancer or not. Now let's understand the five-step approach I used to conduct a cohort study on smokers. My first step is to select my study population. In this case, my study is based on a cohort of smokers. My second step is to obtain the data on exposure. I collect my data from personal interviews, mailed questionnaires and hospital records. My third step is to select a comparison group. In this case, I compare the cohort of smokers with a comparison group, or in other words, a cohort of non-smokers. My fourth step is to follow up. I do this by periodic examinations or telephone calls. This step may go on for years or even decades. My final step is to analyze. In this step, I proceed to analyze all the collected data and determine if the disease occurred in both the exposed and non-exposed groups. Cohort studies are very beneficial because they help me calculate the incidence and conclude the cause and effect relationship. But they also have certain drawbacks. These are, I require a large population, it is time consuming and it is expensive. 
The term cohort study was first used in 1935 by Frost to describe studies that compared the incidence of tuberculosis by age and sex. Moving on now to the third design, the ecological studies. In this type of study, I try to understand the relationship between outcome and exposure at a population level, where population represents a group of individuals with a shared characteristic, such as geography, ethnicity, or socio-economic status. Here, I study the population as a whole rather than the individual. I then apply this to the population being studied. Let's consider this example of cholera. The study by John Snow regarding a cholera outbreak in London is considered to be one of the first ecological studies to solve a health issue. He mapped the locations of deaths caused by cholera to determine that the source of the disease was a water pump on Broad Street. To stop the disease, he had the pump handle removed in 1854, which stopped the deaths in that area. Now let us understand the benefits of ecological studies. A large number of people can be included in this type of study. A large number of risk-modifying factors can be examined. However, I also faced a few challenges with this design. The ecological fallacy could lead me to believe that apparent risk associations between various groups of people do not necessarily accurately reflect the true associations between individuals within those groups. For example, let's take the case of cholera. Based on the findings, I cannot generalize that the water pump causes cholera in other areas too. Pop quiz We have now come to the end of this video where I explained all the details of testing my hypothesis in a process called analytical epidemiology. The next step is to confirm my hypothesis using experimental epidemiology. This will be discussed in our next video. We hope you had fun learning with us.